Leafs Converts, Hockey World. What's going on? This is the Leafs Convo Podcast. I'm Norman James, your host. Thank you for embarking on a brand new episode with us, my partner in crime, podcast-wise. Mike Augello is standing by. He and I are going to talk about William Nylander. He's an impact player, right? But what's the impact of his contractual status going to be on the organization, especially if he has to hold out? Is this going to pit his camp and Nylander's huge faction of fans versus the organization at a time we don't need these kind of distractions? Mike and I will get into it a little bit. Plus, we'll chew on his top 25 least prospect list for HockeyBuzz.com. Some interesting stuff in there and talk a little extra about John Tavares. We know the guy brings all the skill in the world, but can he take his game to an even greater level and add a little bit more roughness and toughness? Because apparently the Leafs need that kind of stuff, right? He can lead the way and the Leafs don't have to go out and get a face puncher. We'll talk about it. Mice ready to go. I'm ready to go. I know you are too. The Leafs Combo Podcast starts right now. And here he is, the legend himself, Mike Agello. Hello, sir. Good morning, Norman. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Your Yankees acquired... Andrew McCutcheon, so you're off to the races. You're going to win the 2018 World Series, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> well, not the way that they're playing. If they're losing the Miami and Chicago White Sox and Detroit, that doesn't that doesn't exactly uh, give anybody who's a baseball fan who roots for the Yankees confidence. Plus, the Red Sox keep winning, and I mean, who knows? That, that, that's the thing. The playoffs are a new beginning, and you never. I, I personally think the Red Sox are going to lose. Uh, and not win the World Series, but that's just my, I guess, my vehement hatred of them and uh, and just realism. But that we'll would see. be nice. Don't forget, uh, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It, exactly. feels like, it feels like the offseason has been a marathon, one with some really important and exciting uh, stops along the way, but we are nearing the finish line. We can, we can see the tape, and we're about to break through it, knowing that um, the rookie tournaments, training camp, all sorts of stuff related to the start of the 18-19 NHL season is just about upon us. So you have to be really excited. There's also some um, trepidation uh, and a little nervousness and some concern over the fact that the Maple Leafs and William Nylander have not come to terms on a pact yet, Mr. RFA. What do you say, Mike Agello? Well, I mean, you're right in the sense that the, the regular, not the regular season, but the beginning of camp, is right upon us next weekend. The rookie tournament in Laval is taking place between the Leafs senators and Canadians. And the following weekend is the beginning of training camp uh, in Toronto. And then three days in Niagara falls. And, you know, at that point, the Leafs want William Neal under, under contract, but, and, and I, uh, there is, I mean, you know, the, yesterday the uh, Noah Hannafin contract was signed uh, in Calgary. He was acquired from Carolina in that deal with Dougie Hamilton, and he was an RFA. And uh, they got him for six years at a little under $5 million for a defenseman who I think is pretty good. Now we're talking a forward, and we're talking somebody who scored over 60 points two years in a row. And I think there's there is the question regarding Nylander is whether it's going to be a deal as you know similar to Hannafin in terms of length five, six, seven years, or if it's going to be a two or three year bridge deal. And I think that, I don't know if that's the holdup. I I get the impression that, you know, the Leafs may want to do more than one contract, meaning, you know, either Matthews or Marner and Nylander and get them both done or announce them both at the same time. Um, I mean, that's very possible. It's not, you know, not impossible. So I mean, that might be some of the holdup, but I, I, I have confidence that they will get a deal done before training camp uh, starts in a couple of weeks. Yeah, you're really going to want to make sure that this situation is handled professionally and delicately because there is a f- faction of the fan base that is just so supportive of William Nylander and won't look at any issue in the contractual process as just part of the process, but more of, well, Nylander must not have the same credibility or respect that Mm -hmm. some of these other Maple Leafs have. So the Maple Leafs want to make sure that they are projecting a a calm and and a respect for William Nylander uh, throughout this entire saga to make sure that once all is signed and all is fine and dandy and things are complete, that there is no lingering sentiment out there that you know one player is being 
um, treated lesser than the others because these are sensitive times, Mike, even though these are exciting times for the Maple Leafs. Yeah, and I, I think that Kyle Dubas is very careful to – and, you know, he's his first move, his first impact move, obviously, was the Tavares signing, and he signed him for seven years. But when you're talking about players that are incumbents on the on the roster, like Neander, like Marner and Matthews, who are the, you know, the cornerstones of the future, um, I think they all have to be treat, treated with equal consideration. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, there's going to be negotiations. There's going to be a give and take. Um, you know, they're a player like Nikolai Ehlers, who I think was taken one pick after Neilander signed last year when he was eligible to, to sign an extension. He signed, I think it was seven years at six million per. Um, uh, David Pasternak, who was drafted the same year as Neilander, uh, but lower in the first round, but has had a, I think, a, arguably a better career so far. Uh, more goals. He's, you know, he's signed for closer to seven million dollars. So there is a range here, and and I think the thing that has to be taken into consideration is how long that deal is. If it's six or seven years, and you're buying two or three years of unrestricted free agency, then the then the amount is going to go up. That's why if there's a fear that maybe Mitch Marner is going to ask mo for more money coming off a big year, they might you know, go towards a bridge deal with Nealander to compensate for, you know, the uncertainty of what Marner is going to ask for. But that that's that's the whole thing. And that's what Dubis and Brandon Pridham and Lawrence Gilman are 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 factoring in with these negotiations, uh the, the cap ramifications down the line. This is the Leafs combo, Norman James with Mike Ajello. The other aspect here is how much do the Maple Leafs want the Nealander camp to influence the result of this process. The Nylander people know what they're up against, what the team is up against now and will be up against uh, in, in an attempt to get all of these superstars signed. So how much is Kyle Dubas um, putting the onus on the Nylander camp to be responsible in their ask, Mike, knowing that Nylander is only going to be as good with the late beliefs as the rest of his crew who still need to get paid. Mm -hmm. So how much money do you want, Nylander crew, but also how much do you want to succeed in this environment? Because we will be able to tell in, in what you're asking for. Well, the it's funny because the optimum word mentioned by Dubis and mentioned by Nylander when I was part of a media scrum at Smash Fest earlier this month, the optimum word was patience. And in the, in this, you know, and Nylander used it as well, the Leafs are being patient or Kyle is being patient. And the, the organization is saying, well, we're going to be patient until, and I'm assuming what they mean is until we get the player for what we want to get him for. And I, I'm pretty sure that the Leafs are hoping that the model that they can follow is the model of Tampa Bay in the sense that, you know, they're big players, Hedman, Kucherov, Stamkos, uh, Ryan McDonough, who they just signed to an extension this summer, all took a little less for the common good, for the you know the overall competitiveness of the franchise to be able to fit more players in and keep some players in the organization to improve their chances to win win the Stanley Cup. And that's you know we know that Tavares took uh, took eleven million times seven years for the Leafs. And I'd take that right now, but he had a chance to take 13 million from San Jose and didn't. And I think what Dubas is going to try to do is try to get Matthews, try to get Marner, try to get Neil under on the same page and take maybe just a hair less, you know, they'll get paid. They, you know, they're deserving of being paid, mm -hmm. but not absolute top dollar because that, you know, if they take a little less that enables them down the road to keep, key players like Connor Brown or Zach Hyman when their contracts come up. And that's a, an important part of being a competitive team is to be able to retain, you know, support players sure. and secondary players. We've pedestalized these guys, I think a little prematurely, but we don't know what kind of guys they are, what kind of competitors they are, what kind of winners they are. We know what John Tavares is all about because he's been in the league nearly a decade. Who is William Nylander going to be? Is he going to come across as a selfish prick? Or is he going to come across as a guy who understands that at this moment of his career, being on this team, he is going to have to take a contract or an offer that is um, just as friendly to the organization uh, 
as it is to him. Well, so I, it, where where are these guys? Like, where are these guys in terms of their mindset? Is it more for me right now or more about the team? Because that is something they're going to be confronted with. And for someone like William Nylander, uh, that's, I mean, that's, that's a decision that he's going to have to make uh, sooner rather than later. The, the, the elder statesman on the team now, John Tavares, has put his money where his mouth is. Will the other guys do the same? And that's the question. There's still lingering questions. I mean, I don't think as much with, with Matthews. I think the only concern with Matthews coming off of last year is durability. But, you know, it, I think that the injuries that he had were sort of freakish. Um, Marner, I think, has very little question marks in terms of his game. You know, he he led the team in scoring last year. He was arguably their best player in the playoffs. We know his skill. We know his playmaking ability. You know, he, t- he appears to me to be a – you know, a top 10 NHL winger at the age of 21. Um, Nylander, there's still some question. And then, you know, it's like he's had two 60-point seasons. He's played with Matthews. Um, when Matthews was out and he was moved to center, he was okay, but he wasn't great. So the question is, is he more than just a complimentary player? And that's see, that is the roll of the dice when it comes to the Leafs and and a new contract is if they buy in, and I, I think they probably do, that Neilander is an impact player rather than a support player or a secondary player or a complimentary player, then you know they it's in their best interest to pay him what a you know a good player makes. And you know if they, if there's still some hesitancy, then they might go the bridge deal. But I think that what they're going to end up doing is they're going to sign him to you know, a five, six or seven year deal. And, you know, they believe in, in, in the type of mm-hmm. player he is and that that's where they're going to go. Mike, here's the conflict right now. Fans, God love them. We love them. We need them. Uh, ma- many of whom support this podcast. Many don't. That's okay. They will eventually, we hope. Um, want Nylander to get paid. I mean, he's, he's, he's the poster on their lockers. He is uh, the, the wallpaper on their smartphones. Um, he is the avatars, the images that are, are posted across social media. They love him. I mean, he's a heartthrob. Uh, he's a 60-point guy. He's statistically you know, one of the best players in the league. The, the Leafs know that. But the Leafs also need a guy who's going to fit in uh, financially to a puzzle, a process, a package that is being conformed and configured to win a Stanley Cup. And that's the key. If it doesn't work, then it's, it'll look as, a, as if it's a slight towards William Nylander. But for, for the Maple Leafs, this is all about fitting the pieces together to win a Stanley Cup. This is not about satisfying the ego of William Nylander and his fans. And William Nylander and his crew have to ask themselves, you know, are we right now at a point where we should be demanding money like Matthews or demanding money like um, Tavares or demanding top dollar at this point, putting the Maple Leafs in a position where their goal of aligning everything perfectly is thwarted in order to satisfy what William Nylander wants and satisfy what his supporters want. That is the conflict right now. And that is, it's a difficult thing for people to reconcile. But when all is said and done, the Maple Leafs have to do what is right, regardless of the player that they are um, negotiating with, to get this team to where it needs to be. And that's to win a Stanley Cup. The Leafs have never been in a better position to uh, reach the promised land than they are right now. And they have to tread smartly, uh, you know, towards that ultimate goal. And in the end, if that means not giving somebody like William Nylander what he wants exactly on the dot in order to, to keep this train on the tracks, then... Mike, I know it's a tough pill to swallow, but so be it. Uh, one more point on Nylander, and then I want to talk about your top 25. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I just, I, I think that right now where things are, there is enough evidence that they're going to get a long-term deal done. But if you think about it, and if there is some question there, the difference in terms of salary for say, say he signs a two-year bridge deal, more than likely the salary range is going to be in the four to four and a half million dollar range. On a six or seven year deal, he's probably going to make six and a half to a little below seven. So you're talking a difference of two to two and a half million dollars over the next two years. That, I mean, that's a significant amount. So 
that's where the quandary is. I mean, I think in, in general, you save more uh, if you sign the player to the long-term deal, if he turns out to be the player that you expect him to be. Because after those two years, if he scored 75, 80 points playing with Austin Matthews, then you're talking about a probably a six or seven year deal after that for more than $7 million. Cause he's put four years in a row uh, at a high level. And that's, you know, that's the, that's the role of the dice. So I think they prefer to get him locked up long-term now and to get him on a more friendly amount now. And I think eventually there, you know, I think there's, I think there's a, a reasonable um, position on both sides and I think it'll, eventually get to the point where just before training camp, they get a deal done, but we'll see. Nylander has to get paid. Marner has to get paid. Matthews has to get paid. And don't forget um, next season, Jake Gardner has to get paid. That's another byproduct of having a really good team. And um, it is a double-edged sword, Mike. You want all these good players. You have the potential to win a championship, but if you're going to have all these good players, all of these good players are going to want Good salaries, and uh, that is the challenge. But we leave it up to Kyle Dubas and his staff to try to pull that off. We'll support them along the way. This is the Leafs Convo Podcast, Norman James, along with Mike Angelo. How do you listen to us uh, when you do? Is it through your favorite podcast platform, or are you dialed in, committed to what we do here on the YouTube channel? Let me know in the YouTube comment section. Also, for a future Mike's Mailbag, if you have any questions, concerns, queries, thoughts for Mr. Angelo, Hashtag capital letters, ask Mike. For Hockey Buzz, Mike, you've been working on your top 25 Leafs prospects. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, yeah, I mean, this is this has been the slow part of the year. Um, you know, anywhere from the early to mid-August to the beginning of September is when I usually will do a, you know, some sort of writing project. And this year I decided because, you know, there with, with the Leafs organization, with a lot of the previous – generation of prospects now on the Leafs. I think, you know, now it's more, um, you know, learning more about the next generation of young players and where they stand in terms of, uh, you know, how, how they're ranked. So uh, what I, what I did was I, I touched base with our mutual friend, Gus Katsaros and, uh, and Russ Cohen, who we've had on the uh, combo before uh, and got their uh, feelings on a top 25 ranking, you know, sent it to them and say, you know, do you, you give me suggestions of who you think I've rated too high or too low. And they gave me their feedback. And then I did a, a uh, analysis of every one of the uh, top 25, starting with JD Greenway as the number 25 uh, uh, num- uh, a prospect going all the way up to number one, who was Timothy Lilligren. Um And I, there are probably a few su- surprises. I know that uh, in other lists that had ranked the prospects, a guy like Dakota Joshua, who some people may have forgotten about, um, but could have an impact on this team within a year. Uh, they they left him off the list. He was a 2014 draft pick, but he's a senior at Ohio State. He played uh, in the in the Final Four in the Frozen Four last year for Ohio State. He's a big center, six foot three. He's he's really quick. Um, he, I don't think he's ever going to be a big scorer in the league, but I think you know with the fact that on fourth line center right now you've got you know, Freddie Gauthier, Parra Lindholm, and Josh Juris, if you have a 23 or 24-year-old guy coming out of four years in the NCAA as a finished product, um, I think that's a pretty de- – and, he, and he's a good player. It's a That's a pretty decent prospect, and I had him ranked in uh, 11th, and I think that might be, actually be a little low because next year he could be the Leafs' fourth-line center if they sign him. Do you find it more rewarding, more interesting, more fun – to examine prospects and their uh, potential in an environment that is not so um, pressure filled or where the uh, maximum impact of these young prospects is not immediately required or required ASAP. It's refreshing that anybody who looks at the Maple Leafs organization and their f- tracks their prospect isn't looked at, looked upon as, a, as being sort of a kook. Um, because, you know, back in the day, you know, you, you know, like you said, like Luke Shen, okay. He was a fifth overall pick, but if you were tracking guys who were picked in the third or fourth round and saying, well, they're going to be in the the NHL in a couple of years, people would sort of laugh because that usually didn't happen with the Leafs organization. But in recent history, you know, they've 
they've shown uh, an ability to find players in the lower rounds. And, you know, we're going to see, I mean, Andreas Janssen is a seventh round pick. Um, they, they lucked out that, you know, he apparently had an asthmatic condition and uh, the Swedish scout for the Leafs, Tommy Bergman, discovered uh, that, you know, he, it had been treated or he, he, he had found out that he didn't, that it was being medically treated and they got him in the seventh round. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's a guy who plays like a second round pick and he was a Swedish rookie of the year, Swedish hockey league rookie of the year. So they found a gem there. There, you know, you got players like Dermot and Jeremy Bracco, who I think will be an NHL or within a couple of years. So they're, they're actually allowing these players to develop they're they're not rushing them before they're ready, and I think you know Luke Shen is the prototypical uh, <clears throat> example of that. Where a kid who played in the NHL at 18 years old and by 21, it was clear that he had not been properly developed. Now you never know whether he you know he would have been a better player uh, if he had stayed in junior for an extra year, but more than likely he would have. And I think that's the one positive about this organization. They could have rushed William Nylander to the NHL a few years ago. Instead, they kept him in the AHL for almost a full year and gave him a taste of the NHL. And the same thing with Brown and Hyman and a few other players. And I think that, you know, they're not going to rush Timothy Liljegren if he's ready for the NHL. And he was my top rated prospect. If he, if he's ready for the NHL this year, then he'll play. If, if they think he's good enough to be a seventh or eighth defenseman, then he's going to play with the Marlies. They're not going to rush their young players. They're going to, you know, use the Detroit Red Wings model, of maybe mm. overcooking them a little bit. But that in the end, I think is better because these players step into the NHL ready to ready to run and not to not struggle. It'll be interesting, interesting to see what happens with guys like Lilia Grin or any young defenseman who is who vaults themselves up into a uh, you know a, 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 into the conversation of being on the on the NHL roster because we already have a lot of uh, preconceived notions, but many are are relatively ironclad in in truth that the the defense has some deficiencies, inefficiencies, some issues uh, that we're expecting to be exposed along the way. And to have these young players step into a, a defensive storyline that could become a powder keg puts them, one, in a position to maybe, you know, be a hero, be a savior, um, you know, grow beyond their years as a defenseman and, and you know, take on a, a real serious challenge and, and be rewarded for it or become a victim of it. And, you know, that is something that I hope that the, the uh, management and the coaching staff are cognizant of and are going to um, cause them to be protective of these players, considering the potential circumstance ahead, Mike. Another thing I wanted to bring up was um, a question that uh, came from the YouTube comment section. And it's, it's speculation. Is there going to be a player during this process of training camp leading up towards puck drop in early October that the fan base will get behind and will rally in support of in hopes that this player makes the team? A la, you know, a Josh Levo, a Frankie Corrado of the past. Yeah. Um, we've, we've seen this with, with other players in years gone by where, you know, they have a good preseason, um, you know, then they, all the data comes out to support the kinds of things they do. And there's a real expectation that this player who's relatively obscure or young, or some might think is a sympathetic figure mm -hmm. should make the team. So if you had to predict, who would that be? Well, I'll go off the board a little bit. And I had him ranked in the, in my prospect list as well as Mason Marchman. And you know, a couple of years ago, if I, if I said Mason Marchment is a future NHL or I probably would have been, you know, they would have found a, uh, you know, a, a straight jacket and sent me out of uh, Rico Coliseum. <laughs> um, but Mason Marchment was a key contributor last year to the Marlies Calder Cup victory. He, his skating has improved immensely. And the one, you know, one of the concerns about the Leafs, you know, this year and going forward is they're a very highly skilled team, but there's not a lot of pushback. And I know I'm not saying they need a goon. I'm not saying that they, you know, but they, you know, Roman Polak is gone. Leo Komarov is gone. You know, if, if things get rough, 
you know, it's basically, you know, Ron Hainsey, Nazem Kadri. you know, you don't have a lot of pushback. Mason Marchment, um, he's big, he's, he's quick. He stirs the pot. He, I, I think he'd be a prototypical fourth line energy forward. And I don't think he's somebody somebody who uh, is incapable of playing that role. Now, I, you know, he played a fourth line role with the Marlies. Um, and it was, but it wasn't a prototypical fourth line. He played with uh, Adam Brooks and Trevor Moore. And Trevor Moore was one of the leading scorers in, for the Marlies in, during the postseason. And, and Marchman had some key goals as well. So, I, I don't think he's going to make the team out of training camp, but uh, in, in terms of exciting the fan base in preseason games, you know, he's going to stir the pot and he'll probably get some people excited. And I think, you know, you could see maybe at the end of the year or in a situation where they need a little, a little energy on that fourth line. If guys like Lebo or Tyler Ennis don't work out, you could see Marchman make his NHL debut. So I, I think that's a possibility. The NHL is rough. A team's got to be tough. What kind of truculence and pugnacity does John Tavares bring, Mike? We'll wrap it up with this. Um, I mean, he doesn't. I, I don't think he shies away from it. I don't think he. I mean, he's he's too talented of a player to get involved in chicanery. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to draw the fire from other teams. You know players like Brad Marchand or Patrice Bergeron, they're, they're going to try to get in his kitchen because he's such a talented player. Um, I don't think he'll get pushed around, but you know, you don't want him fighting battles. You don't want him dropping the gloves. You don't want Austin Matthews dropping the gloves and hardly anybody drops the gloves anymore. But you know, at, at some points you have to push back and fight for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think yep. some of the players on the Leafs can do that, but I don't think that there, there, there isn't like an overwhelming physical force on this team, like a Zdeno Chara, like a Victor Hedman, uh, you know, like, like a Milan Lucic for all of his detractors in Edmonton. And I think that that's something that down the line, the Leafs may need. Yeah. But right now I think they're just going to overwhelm other teams with their offense. Yeah. You're going to want to sprinkle in some accessories down the stretch the, at the trade deadline. But I'll tell you, John Tavares, Mitch Marner, Austin Matthews, these guys, they don't, they're not looking for fights. They're not looking to get overly physical. They've got too much scoring to do, too many, too many zeros to add to their bank account uh, in doing so. But these guys aren't going to put up with bullshit either. Uh, they've got egos. Um, they've got pride. They've got dignity. And uh, they're not going to put up with it. So while this team we'd like to see have a little bit more, I don't know, um, just a, a little, I don't, I, I, don't even, I don't even know how to describe it. You, you want it to be a little bit tougher, I suppose. But I think these guys are developing their mental toughness and developing the toughness in terms of, um, you know, just being relentless and, and, and playing as well as they can in the face of adversity. And, that, and that's developing along the way. Michael, thanks so much, man. That is a wrap for this edition of the Leafs Convo Podcast. Thanks for being aboard. You've heard what we have to say. Now it is your turn to have your say. Absolutely unleash in the YouTube comment section right now. Create a great conversation about this podcast like you've done with previous podcasts. And we are certainly off to the races. You can also reach out to us through social media at I Am Sports Art, at The Leafs Convo, at Mike and Buffalo. These are fantastic times to be a fan of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And these are really good times to be a content creator that focuses on the Toronto Maple Leafs. In the very near future, we're going to have some big news about how we're going to elevate the status of this podcast. Plus, we have some talent acquisitions to pass your way as well. I'm so excited about it. I hope you'll be a part of it. Subscribe, follow, do what you have to do to stay linked with the Leafs Convo Podcast. From Mike Ogello, I'm Norman James. The Leafs Convo Podcast is out. Talk to you soon.